Welcome guys to lesson three here for unit two as we continue to study the chemistry of biology. Um, in this lesson we're going to look at the macromolecules or the building blocks of life. First thing I want to start off with though is I want to ask you a question. Have you had your breakfast today? What about lunch? We've had some fantastic conversations in the classroom over the last two, three weeks about uh, the new cafeteria lunches. But have you eaten anything? Anything at all? Because I hope so. If not, you are starving your body of extremely necessary substances we call macromolecules. Don't freak out. Don't run away from the computer screen, please. It's a very large, complex, and intimidating word. I know, I understand, but don't worry, boys and girls. It's a piece of cake. Here's how we're going to break it down and slay the dragons that are the macromolecules. Topics that we're going to cover in this video are going to be the definition and the four types of macromolecules. We're also going to check out the structures and functions for each macromolecule. And finally, we're going to show and talk about how each macromolecule is obtained, how you get it into your body. First up, let's go ahead and let's break down the term that is macromolecule a little bit. Macro is a term that means big or large. It's the opposite of micro, which means small or little. It might be confusing to put a term that means big with another term that we know describes something super small, like a molecule. But macromolecule literally means large molecule. A water molecule has three parts, one oxygen atom and two hydrogen atoms. It would be considered a common, everyday, run-of-the-mill molecule. Another common, everyday, run-of-the-mill molecule would be glucose, which has 24 parts. It's much more complex, but it's still considered a molecule because it is the smallest structural unit for one of our macromolecules that we're going to look at here in a second. Okay? It's got 12 hydrogen atoms, 6 oxygen, and 6 carbon atoms. But it is not quite yet a macromolecule. Defining macromolecules, macromolecules should be simple. What we have are really big, really large, complex, set combinations of different elements, molecules. Okay? So they're real big, real large, complex. They have a set ratio of different elements present in them. There are four types or groups of macromolecules um, that we're going to study. Okay, and they're usually referred to as the building blocks of life. They are not living pieces of material, but they are the chemical structures that give rise to sustaining the proper structures and functions for your body to maintain life at the cellular level. Let that digest a second. Go back, rewind that, listen to that again, okay? Carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids are the four groups, and each has their very own special structures that execute very specific functions. The first ones we're going to look at are the carbohydrates. These are organic compounds that are composed of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. They're also generated with a set ratio of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. One carbon to every two hydrogens to every one oxygen. A one to two to one ratio. We have a few different types of carbohydrates. The first type I want to talk about are known as monosaccharides. We also have what we call disaccharides and polysaccharides. But monosaccharides are the simplest of sugars or the simplest carbohydrate. For instance, glucose. The diagram I just circled down there to the bottom left. Glucose is the actual building block for carbohydrates. It is as simple as sugar. It's the C6H12O6 molecule. So it's not yet a macromolecule, but it's the molecule that builds to the macromolecules. Okay? Monosaccharides and disaccharides are known as simple sugars. There's no breaking them down. There's no needing to tear them apart. They are immediately absorbed into your bloodstream and taken to your cells so they could be used at as energy at the cellular level. Some examples of monosaccharides are glucose, fructose, sucrose, and table sugar. Polysaccharides, on the other hand, like starch, glycogen, and cellulose, are three or more monosaccharides, glucose, 
bonded together. Like we can see here in the diagram to the bottom right when I finally scroll down to it. There we go. Okay. Polysaccharides not only provide energy at the cellular level, but they are these storehouses. Why? Because there's multiple, many, many, many. That's the root word for poly. That's what poly means. That's the root word what poly means there. Many, many, many glucose molecules bonded together. So you already have a lot of chemical energy stored in the bonds for a glucose molecule, but now bond a bunch of them together, and you got tons of chemical energy waiting to be used by your cells. Starch houses, stores a ton of that chemical energy, and it's created by plants. Glycogen is how it is stored and adapted inside your human body. So what's the major function of a carbohydrate? Well, if you're a simple sugar, like monosaccharides and disaccharides with the blue asterisk next to them, you are providing chemical energy almost immediately to your cells. If you're a complex sugar, a macromolecule, a carbohydrate, a polysaccharide, like starch or glycogen, you're a storehouse of cellular energy. You have a ton of cellular energy that you can eventually provide to cells to carry out cellular activity. So carbs provide energy at the cellular level. One other function, one other function some carbohydrates have are to provide a little bit of structure. Plants can manipulate their carbohydrates, their starches, to form cellulose, which is a very structural unit to help provide structure and support to plants and plant material. Another macromolecule group we have are the lipids. These guys are nonpolar molecules that are composed of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So similar to the carbohydrates. Nonpolar means they are not soluble in water. Water's polar. Remember how water can kind of break some things down because of its polarity? Well, lipids cannot be broken down by water. Some examples are fats, steroids, and phospholipids. Now, there are many different examples of lipids, and they also serve many different functions. We're really going to focus on fats, but we'll see phospholipids in our next unit when we're studying the cell because cells have what we call cell membranes. So they've got a thin layer of fat inside of this cell membrane that keeps water out and also keeps water in. So pretty cool there due to its, you know, non-polarity. But let's take a look at fats first. So you can see in this black boxed diagram, we've got three separate structures. These are what we see and are known as two major groups of fats, saturated and unsaturated. All fats, though, are composed of fatty acids and glycerol, or glycerine, okay, or glycerine, just depends on who you're talking to here, okay, but these fatty acids are the building blocks for fats. You usually see three of these guys to one glycerol composing a fat. Now, like I said, there are two major groups here for fats. They're saturated and unsaturated. Saturated fats are the ones that have a carbon atom bonded with two hydrogen atoms. And every carbon atom is bonded with two hydrogen atoms. Therefore, the fatty acid tail is saturated with hydrogen atoms. We usually see these fats as solids at room temperature, like butter, animal fat, or cooking shortening. The other group we have are unsaturated fats. Unsaturated fats are not completely saturated with hydrogen atoms. There are a few carbons that are only bonded to one hydrogen atom, and that greatly changed the chemical structure, which therefore will change a lot of the chemical properties, or atomic properties, or molecular properties, whatever. These fats act and are a little different. For instance, they're liquids at room temperature, and these are typically the fats that are a little healthier for you to consume. Now, what's the major purpose of fats? Well, they provide a little bit of structural assistance, i.e. at the cellular level, like inside the cell membrane. But really, fats are gigantic energy storage units. 
where carbohydrates are all about providing energy at the cellular level, fats are all about storing chemical energy at the cellular level. Notice the abundance of carbon and hydrogen atoms in each one of these fatty acid tails and in each one of these types of fats. There's a lot of chemical bonding going on, therefore a lot of chemical energy storage taking place. So fats are fantastic little energy storage units. Our next macromolecule group are the proteins. Proteins like carbs and lipids are composed of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen elements along with a little nitrogen. And they serve multiple structures, excuse me, serve multiple functions and have many different structures. Enzymes, for instance, are proteins that help to promote chemical reactions inside the cell level. Some proteins also assist in providing some structural function, as in collagen fibers helping to provide certain structures a little support inside the human body. Hair, muscle fibers, different tendons and ligaments inside your body, really composed of protein-based collagen fibers. You can also have some proteins that act as not as antibodies, I have a little misspelling here, but as antibodies. These antibodies are protein-based structures that can help defend against infection or fight infection inside of your body. And last but not least, hemoglobin is a protein found in your blood that can help carry oxygen gas to your cells. You need oxygen. You know that. But you need oxygen inside your cells to carry out some special cellular processes. Hemoglobin, protein-based hemoglobin, assist in that process. Now the building blocks of protein, the building blocks of protein are known as amino acids. There are 20 different amino acids inside your body. These 20 combine with each other in many different methods, many different uh, sequences to create and generate all of the different proteins that are present inside of a human. Pretty special stuff there that we've got all of these proteins that we have, we know what they're composed of, and they're only composed of 20 different amino acids. Now when we're looking at these proteins, they can be very simplistic or they can be very complex. And depending on their simplicity or complexity, that affects their structure and function. They can have a primary structure, a secondary structure, a tertiary structure, or a quaternary structure. A first, second, third, or fourth level structure. Each increase in level, we increase in complexity and increase or adjust, excuse me, in structure and function. The main things we need to know from proteins are that the building blocks are amino acid, they're composed of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, and they serve a multitude of functions, okay? They serve a multitude of duties at the cellular level. Our last group we're going to look at are the nucleic acids. These guys have a lot of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and phosphorus composing them. Their building block is known as the nucleotide. Nucleotides are composed of three separate structures. A sugar group, so something very similar to a glucose molecule. A nitrogen base, which is another structure that's really similar to a glucose molecule, but instead of some carbon, it's got some nitrogen in there instead and also a phosphate group. This is where the phosphorus comes into play here. Phosphorus bonds with oxygen and forms this compound we know as phosphate. Okay? Basically these nucleotides are individual structural units that compose nucleic acids. There are two types of nucleic acids, DNA and RNA. Each one encodes specific information to create structures in your cell and how your cells should function. So the blueprints of life, the instruction manual for life is housed in RNA and DNA. And it's the sequence of nucleotides that build the RNA and DNA that give these specific instructions on what to do and when to do it inside of the cell. Our last, our last video topic, let's talk about how we get and obtain these macromolecules. Carbohydrates are found in many foods but mainly located in grains, fruits, vegetables, and sugary snacks. Your body is constantly craving energy. Every cell needs it. 
So you need to make sure that you're bringing in a necessary amount of carbohydrates in your daily diet. Who likes Meat Lovers Pizza from Pizza Hut? Are you the type of person that gets the biggest steak at Windmill or Willows on the weekend? Who can down an entire fried chicken at Freddy's? Or broasted chicken at Freddy's, wherever you want to call it. If you can answer yes to any of these carnivorous themed questions, then you're probably pulling in an adequate amount of protein. Protein is found in meat, any kind of meat, because meat is muscle, and that's where protein is heavily used. Protein can also be found in nuts, peanut butter, eggs, and legumes. And legumes are nitrogen fixating plants like beans. Another question for you, did you drink your milk today? There's a reason that's on the menu here at lunch, and it's not just due to the fact that it has some protein and calcium, but also it has a solid serving of fat that your body needs. A lot of lipids are found in milk. Some of you may have a little more than others, but fat is a necessary part of your diet and can be found in many, many foods. Any form of butter, grease, shortening, or cooking oil that you may use to cook your food can possess the needed lipids for your cells to continue to function properly. Last but not least, Nucleic acids are found throughout your entire diet. If you're eating something that is, better yet, was alive, don't want anyone eating anything that's still alive and kicking, that might be a little gross, then you're consuming cells, okay? Cells contain DNA and RNA, which are composed of the building blocks known as nucleic acids. By ingesting that food, you're bringing in, the more, ma you're bringing in more material to be broken down and reorganized into newer nucleic acids that your cells can Okay, so that completes this lesson. I know we went through a lot of technical jargon in this video, but like everything else in this class, each concept builds onto another one, and then another one, and then another one. So understanding these macromolecules will come in handy when we start discussing the cell, cellular processes, and cellular reproduction. Make sure you have your graphic organizer filled out with the necessary macromolecule information, okay? You can see it pasted right here on the screen. All right. Make sure that you know what each macromolecule is, the composition of each macromolecule, the smallest structural unit or the building block for each macromolecule, and also be able to give some examples for each and state some of the functions, purposes, uses for each macromolecule. There's a lot of information in this video, I know, but it will really help you understand all the other stuff that we're going to do when we're talking cellular processes and cellular structures. Okay. Also, be sure to check through the Micromolecule Lab. You're going to be doing that in class, and it's a pretty complex lab. You're actually going to be identifying different foods that possess some of the different macromolecules. It will be a lot of fun. I guarantee it. But please, make sure you look through this lab first. It will really help you in class to better understand everything. Finally, do you have any questions? Boy, I hope so. Again, a lot of information in this video. So if you have questions, that's great. That's awesome. Ask me. Ask a friend. Let's solve some of the issues here, okay? That's all I've got. See you in class, guys.